Welcome you all on behalf of the University of Florida IFAS Extension Polk County. And we'll be talking today about a topic, what's not to liken and other things that grow on trees. Our horticulture webinar team um, consists of Ann Yazlanis. She's our residential horticulture agent and master gardener volunteer coordinator. And myself, I'm Julie Shell, the Florida Family Landscaping Program Coordinator. We also have some Master Gardener volunteers that are helping facilitate this webinar today. So today's topics, um, we'll start off with some natural things about trees. Um, then we'll venture into some harmless things that grow on trees. Then we'll uh, look at some harmful things as well that might um, appear on your trees. Then we'll look at signs that your tree may be in decline. And um, we'll also talk about hiring a certified arborist since that's related to tree health. Okay, so speaking of natural things on trees, we're gonna talk about trees with interesting bark. Okay, trees with interesting bark. So often these trees might be deciduous or semi-evergreen. And so this means that they'll lose their leaves in the winter as they go dormant, but they leaf back out in the spring. And so during their dormancy, these trees um, can act like living sculptures as they show off their interesting bark and shapely trunks and branches. And so you might think something is wrong with the tree when you see the variations in the bark, but we're gonna explore a few trees with very interesting bark that's part of their natural appeal. And so here, uh, pictured here is a, a crepe myrtle. And so you can see um, that interesting bark and uh, variation in color. And so um, it's very interesting, but if you didn't know any better, you might think something is wrong with the tree due to the variation in color. So first we'll look at crepe myrtles. Um, there's many different cultivars of crepe myrtle trees that not only have beautiful flowers, but they have very interesting bark. And so pictured here, we have the cultivars Acoma, Comanche, and Miami. Some crepe myrtle trees even have peeling bark, and the color of the trees with peeling bark can range from mottled to light orange, brown, and even a creamy pale color. Some of the cultivars of uh, crepe myrtles that shed their bark include Natchez, Biloxi, Miami, and Appalachia as well. And so you can see there, um, those with the, the interesting bark and the variation. Next, we'll talk about river birch. And this is another tree with interesting or kind of unusual bark in that the bark peels or strips off. And these are two photos of a river birch tree that we have in our Florida Friendly Landscaping Demonstration Garden at our extension office in Bartow. River birch is a fast growing tree and it is a native tree. So if you see this bark and you think, oh no, something's wrong, the bark's peeling off, it's kind of papery and thin, um, that's actually just a natural characteristic of this tree. Next we have Chinese elm. And so this is also often referred to as lace bark elm and that's due to its outer gray bark that peels and reveals this kind of orange colored bark underneath. Um, and so this is just another tree with a very striking bark pattern. Um, these are fairly large trees. One other thing to note about Chinese elm is that they're resistant to Dutch elm disease and are sometimes planted um, instead of other elm trees for this reason. Next, we'll look at Hercules Club. Uh, this is a Florida native tree with sharp spines along the trunk that over time wear down into these stubby projections, as you can see in that picture on the left. And so while it might look like this tree has unusual growth, um, these are actually just worn down spines that are a characteristic of the tree. Um, one other interesting thing to note about Hercules Club is that it is a host plant for the giant swallowtail butterfly. And you can see its caterpillar featured here on the right. Um, and the caterpillar uh, actually resembles bird droppings. So um, another thing you might see all over your Hercules Hercules Club tree, but um, that's just the caterpillar hosting on its um, native host plant. And Hercules Club is a deciduous tree as well. Next, uh, we'll look at Gumbo Limbo, and this is another Florida native tree. And so you can see there on the left it has shiny copper colored bark that often peels away. 
Uh, this tree is often found in South Florida. So if you're venturing around the state and you see this tree, again, there's nothing wrong with it. It just has um, a very unique um, color of bark that also kind of peels away and that's a natural characteristic of that tree. The last tree we'll look at um, that has kind of a, a natural, maybe um, striking appearance is winged elm. This is another uh, tree of Florida. And so the branches actually have these quirky wing-like edging. And so some people might see the branch and think that this growth um, is due to disease or something wrong with the tree, but it's actually just a natural growth habit of this particular tree and um, also where it gets its common name from, winged elm. Uh, so those were just trees with some uh, unique characteristics that might seem alarming, but um, are totally natural. And so now we'll look at some harmless things that grow on trees. So uh, I want to start off by um, explaining epiphytes. And so these are things that get water and nutrients from the air. They're designed to obtain minerals that are dissolved in water that flow over the leaves and branches um, and are not planted in soil. So while they do attach themselves to plants, they do not cause any harm to the plants, unlike mistletoe, which is a parasite, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Another thing about epiphytes is that they tend to thrive in well-lit, moist habitats near rivers um, and lakes or where humidity is fairly high. So Florida's native bromeliads and tillandsia um, are a type of epiphyte and you might see these often in trees especially in natural areas and so again these are epiphytes and they don't cause any harm um, to the tree itself. A couple things to note about Florida's native bromeliads and tillandsia um, is that um, they are threatened often due to collection, um, due to development, and there is um, an invasive Mexican bromeliad weevil that also um, can attack the native bromeliads. So um, certainly we want to protect these species so when you see them, leave them where they are um, and, and uh, know that they're not doing any harm to the tree. Here's just um, a couple more pictures of Florida's native bromeliads um, that are actually Tillandsia species. And so the one on the left, that its common name is Northern Needle Leaf. And then the one on the right, the common name is Cardinal Air Plant. And so again, you might see these growing in trees and of course they've kind of attached or adhered to the tree, but they're epiphytes and um, they're not taking anything from the tree. They're not causing any harm to those trees. Um, also within the bromeliad family, which also includes pineapple plants, are Spanish moss and ball moss. Now, technically both of these are a Tillandsia species. But they're within the bromeliad family. Um, and so they're a type of bromeliad and not a moss at all. And so Spanish moss is identified by its pendant type strands. And then you have ball moss, which is pictured here, and it's small kind of tufted grayish green plant. Now both of these prefer high light and will thrive on the um, trees that may be in decline and have lost some of their leaves. So contrary to popular, popular belief, uh, Spanish moss is not harmful. It gets all of its nutrients from the rain and air, and so it's not causing any harm to the tree. It's not a parasite. It's not taking anything from the tree. Um, and so a little bit more about Spanish moss, um, kind of help you think about it in a way. Um, so one, um, we know that it, it doesn't harm the tree, but it also is, is beneficial to other um, animals and insects as well. And speaking of insects, often people think that Spanish moss is crawling with um, biting insects. And so fallen moss or any plant material on or near the ground may contain these kind of biting bugs, but moss hanging in trees rarely supports them. So that's one thing to know. Uh, many animals also use Spanish moss for protection. This can include insects and other invertebrates that hide or breed in the Spanish moss. Um, there are species of bats that rest in Spanish moss during the day, and even zebra long-winged butterflies can boost in Spanish moss at nighttime. Additionally, um, birds might use the moss to build their nests, and uh, Baltimore Orioles are one of those birds that, that will use Spanish moss to help build their nests. So a note about removing moss. So 
um, it's really not necessary to remove the moss. Um, if you can kind of, you know, if, now that you know that it's um, an epiphyte, it's in the bromeliad family, it's a, a Tillandia species, maybe you can look at it differently um, and know that it's not necessary to remove. Now, if it seems unsightly, um, hand removal is possible, certainly on smaller trees. However, in, in a large shade tree, hand removal um, could be pretty intense and really not necessary at all. Now, there is um, chemical control through a copper-based product that's labeled specifically for the ball or the Spanish moss. However, there's a lot of caution that needs to be taken um, if that product is going to be used because that copper-based herbicide um, or another uh, fungicide could cause harm um, to new tender growth on oak trees. And additionally, um, you know, if you choose to kill the moss, know that you're still gonna have dead moss hanging in the tree. So you have this living plant that wasn't causing any harm to the tree. If you have it um, sprayed with a chemical, then I would think you would still want it removed because now you have this kind of dead plants hanging in your tree. So you just wanna use a lot of caution if you decide to go that route, but really we would say that it's not necessary to remove the moss from your tree. So now, um, lichens. Uh, lichens are very interesting organisms. And so they actually consist of a fungus and an alga growing together in a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, I, found that, I find that super interesting. Um, there's a lot more to this than um, our eyes can even see. So the fungus obtains water and minerals from the air and the material it's growing on, and then it provides structure and protection for the alga or the algae. So the algae then provides carbohydrates and vitamins that that fungus, that it's in this uh, mutually beneficial relationship, needs to grow. Um, additionally, lichens, uh, they can contain nitrogen from um, organic material, uh, plant leaching, and even uh, bird excrement. So the entire um, combination of this fungus and algae structure is called a thallus. And the thallus is so different structurally from either component that it actually takes a microscope to distinguish the fungus from the alga. And so um, I think that's just, you know, we look at these growing on trees and even different structure. Lichens don't only grow on trees. Often you'll see them uh, maybe on rocks, maybe on a bench, on a fence post. Um, there's tons of things that they'll grow on. Um, and so just knowing more about these, um, I think is really interesting. So a little bit more about lichens. So lichens actually benefit humans through their ability um, that they can absorb things in the atmosphere, including uh, pollutants. And so they can provide us with information about the environment around us. Um, heavy metals, sulfur, carbon, and other pollutants in the atmosphere are absorbed into lichens. Um, and then scientists are able to extract these toxins and then determine the levels that are present in our atmosphere. So I think, um, you know, often we see these lichens and they can look pretty alarming as well, especially if you don't know anything about it. You see this covering a tree and you think, uh, you know, something might be wrong, but this is totally harmless um, to the tree and actually pretty beneficial for us when you think about all the things that it can provide for us. And so lichens um, can occur in one of four basic growth forms. So there's crustose, which is kind of a crust-like um, form that grows tight against the substrate. Then there's squamulose. And so these are tightly clustered and kind of slightly flattened, maybe pebble-like. Folios is leaf-like with flat sheets of tissue, and they're not very tightly bound. And then the fruticose is kind of freestanding branching tubes. And so we'll look at a few of these examples. So here on the left, you can see um, this lichen is commonly referred to, or its common name is Christmas lichen, as you might have seen this on a tree. Um, certainly the color is very striking and catches your eye, and you might think, what is that? You know, is that hurting the tree? Is that something wrong with the tree? But turns out it's just a lichen growing on the tree, and you know, it's got its own thing going on with that relationship between the fungus and the algae that uh, makes it up. And then here on the right, you can see a close-up of a um, 
folios or a leafy type of lichen. It's a, a Parmotrema species of lichen. And so um, I'm sure you've seen these um, pretty regularly on trees and maybe you've wondered. And so there are lots, you know, thousands of different species. Um, so there's lots of lichens out there, but um, they're pretty interesting once you know a little bit more about them. In the picture on the left, um, this is actually the, on the ground there is reindeer lichen is its common name. It's a Cladonia um, species. And then the, here on the right, you can see in this tree is a strap lichen. And so both of these are kind of that fruticose form um, of lichen when we talked about the, the four basic forms that lichen can take. Just a couple more pictures of some different forms of lichen that you might see on trees. And so you can see there's so many different um, variations in form and texture and color. Um, here on the left is a fringe tree. And, um, you know, it's just got a type of lichen growing on it. And then um, here on the right is a southern magnolia tree with a few different um, species of lichen. And it's totally harmless. Um, and uh, I think pretty cool, uh, you know, once you understand about lichens. So now we'll move on um, from lichens and we'll talk about um, another kind of harmless thing that you might see in trees and that's resurrection fern. And they can be seen growing on live oaks or even um, in the attached leaf bases or sometimes called boots of our native cabbage palm. And so when the weather is dry, the fern kind of shrivels up and turns gray. But as soon as it rains, the ferns kind of spring back and unfurl. And they're very, you know, um, once again, they have that beautiful green color uh, almost within hours of the rain. Resurrection fern is a native epiphyte. And so you can see in this picture on the left is the, um, the resurrection fern during kind of the dry weather. It's kind of um, shriveled up. It, it, you know, it might appear as if it's died. Um, but as soon as it rains, you can see there on the right, um, it unfurls and has that green color bounce right back. Here's just a couple more pictures of um, resurrection fern. Uh, this is a laurel oak tree. And so you can see that resurrection fern there on the bottom right. And then that's just a close up of that same picture. And so clearly, um, you know, it wasn't during the dry season. Um, and so that is uh, fully green and, and, and sprouted out. Okay, so now that you know, there's um, lots of um, things that grow on trees that are really nothing to worry about. They're not harming your tree. We'll take a look at just a few things. Um, it's not all inclusive, but just a few things that might be harmful on trees. And we'll start off with mistletoe. So mistletoe is actually a parasite and can harm trees. So it takes water and nutrients and even some food from its host tree. It also emits chemical signals that confuse the, the tree, um, both its growth and transport systems. And so as more clumps of mistletoe start to grow, um, it can cause the tree to decline. Older, slow growing trees are most susceptible to mistletoe it's not very often that you see it um, affect younger, healthier trees. And so the parasitic characteristics of mistletoe can weaken or destroy trees that it um, infests, um, especially if those trees are already struggling um, or are in decline. So removing the mistletoe may help re revive the tree. Now, it only grows in deciduous trees, which shed their leaves annually, and that's often when you'll notice the mistletoe growing in the tree. In Florida, um, it's most commonly found in laurel oaks. However, it also can host in elm trees and sycamores. Something else to note about mistletoe is that um, ingestion of it can be harmful. So be sure to keep um, that away from pets and children. Um, it's often spread by birds, but even fruit that falls from the mistletoe clumps um, might stick to another limb below. And once that seed is on that branch, um, a new plant can start to grow. So certainly mistletoe can be a problem, um, but pictured here is American or oak mistletoe. 
And so one important aspect of mistletoe is that it's the only food source for um, the larva of the great purple hair streak. And that's a butterfly that's found throughout the southern United States. And so its caterpillar um, hosts on um, the American mistletoe, which you can see, or the oak mistletoe, um, another common name for that. And so that's kind of a consideration. Um, you know, so in natural settings, this would occur. Um, and so we can see the benefit of mistletoe, but certainly we know that mistletoe can cause harm to trees. So if you need to remove mistletoe, um, you can cut it out of the tree. And so to remove the roots, because this thing is growing in the tree, you'll need to prune um, the branch that it's growing on at least six inches below the spot where the mistletoe is actually attached. Now keep in mind pruning can actually, um, and specifically pruning out the mistletoe may cause damage to the tree's structure. So you wanna use proper pruning techniques when you're trying to remove this. Um, if you're doing it yourself or um, asking a professional, um, be sure to wear head and eye protection um, and after you've handled the plants, be sure to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water. Now there are um, specialized growth regulating chemicals that can be used to help control mistletoe. Um, they're applied to the mistletoe when the, when the tree is dormant. If those are applied when the tree is actively growing, that chemical will actually damage the tree. So you wouldn't be doing any help. Um, you'd actually be causing more harm than the mistletoe was causing at that moment. And that chemical can only be applied by licensed pest control operators. So that's not something um, the average homeowner can do. You would definitely need to hire a licensed um, professional to, to do that if necessary. Um, another thing you might see in trees is strangler fig. And so this is actually a native plant. Um, it's kind of vine-like when it's young and it starts out as an epiphyte. Um, but it can later take over the host tree um, as it kind of grows pretty quickly with these aerial roots that um, it uses to then support itself. It often grows on oak trees and even cabbage palms. And so pictured here, you can see on the left is kind of a young um, strangler fig and it's attached, uh, starting to attach to a tree. It's probably started growing on the tree. Uh, and there on the right, you can see uh, much more mature strangler fig uh, growing uh, with those aerial roots and kind of starting to encompass that tree that it's growing on. So um, certainly um, we would not encourage you to plant strangler fig in your own yard as this tree can get very large. Um, it's really not suitable for a home landscape, um, but it is a native um, tree that you, you might see. Um, certainly, um, you know, if a, a seed drops on a tree, um, then it starts to grow. And so you might be confused, uh, you know, especially if you start to see those aerial roots um, or you drive by and see that, um, that's a strangler fig growing on another tree. And I wanted to point out um, another thing that you might see growing in trees and a note of caution about that. And so in this picture, um, this is a common house plant known as pothos. And this is growing all over this tree, as you can see. It's growing all over the ground. It's growing all over the house. And it's even growing um, into the neighbor's yard. And so this is a common house plant. However, um, pothos is an invasive plant in South Florida and it's actually under caution in Central Florida according to the US IFAS assessment of non-native plants in Florida's natural areas. So while this is a great house plant, um, this is not a plant that belongs outside. You can see how it easily got out of control and has really become um, just taken over this yard as it's growing in the tree, it's growing on the house, all over the yard, it's climbing. Um, and so certainly we want you um, to just use caution when you're you know, installing plants, you know, think about Florida friendly landscaping and right plant, right place and how um, this plant doesn't belong outside, it belongs um, in a pot, you know, maybe on a patio or indoors, but certainly um, it might look cute um, and kind of tropical as it starts to grow up the tree, but you can see how this easily can get out of control um, and certainly um, can start to take over. So just another thing to keep in mind. 
So now we'll look at um, a few signs that your tree might be in trouble. And so we've looked at um, trees, their natural habitat. We've looked at some harmless things, some epiphytes that grow on trees. We've looked at a few harmful things that might grow on trees. And now we'll look at signs potentially um, that your tree, you know, might be struggling. So dead, broken, or hanging branches could pose a threat. Um, they might break off during a storm. Large branches in particular, large branches up high in the tree are of a real concern because they have a potential to hit, um, you know, something, the ground or something else with a pretty high velocity. And so with broken or hanging branches, it's just a matter of time. And so it's important um, to take a look at the, you know, uh, regularly inspect your trees. Um, we're going to talk about um, certified arborists in just a little bit, but having a professional, if you're not sure, um, take a look at your trees. Um, it's also important to note um, that you want to make sure that the tree or the, uh, or specifically the branch is truly dead and not just dormant. Um, we have trees that are deciduous and so they lose their leaves in the winter and they go dormant. Um, so that does not mean the tree is dead. It's just um, gone dormant. And so you definitely want to be careful that you distinguish between an actual dead branch or a dormant tree. And then if you do have any um, hanging or broken branches, um, that you certainly get those taken care of so that they don't cause any further damage or harm. Another point of concern um, that you might think about is potentially wood decay. Um, this can be an issue because um, the wood is broken down by microorganisms. And so this can affect any portion of the tree and ultimately reduce the tree's structural integrity. And so sometimes it can be difficult to detect. We don't always have visual symptoms um, that we have decay in a tree, but sometimes we do. And so some of those visual signs might be conchs or other fruiting bodies, carpenter ants, or even cavities, which we'll talk about next. And so certainly if you have concern about your tree, um, hiring um, a certified arborist professional um, will be beneficial to help you determine um, the health of your tree and the safety of your tree. And as you can see pictured here, um, unfortunately, this tree um, had a chain wrapped around it and was not removed. And you can see um, that has definitely affected the tree. And you can see those fruiting bodies at the bottom of that tree as well. And so sometimes those are present, but you don't always see um, those visual signs. And then um, also, if you have cavities in your um, trees, they can be a point of entry for, um, for decay or for um, fungus. And so this could result from an injury or from improper pruning cuts. So some factors to help determine internal decay could include the cause of the cavity. Um, that would be a clue to you of, of you know, what caused it and you know, is it harmful? Um, certainly the tree's age is also something to consider. The condition or location of that cavity is important to note. Um, another really important thing to note, um, before you examine or check out that cavity, um, you want to make sure that there's not any residents in that um, cavity. You or um, whatever creature might be in that cavity might be startled. So just use caution um, with cavities and trees um, for things that might be living in them. And so you can see um, pictured here is a tree that has a cavity and someone um, has stuck a disposable um, cup in that cavity. And so you can see that that cavity is, um, you know, several inches uh, deep there with the, the cup fitting in the cavity. And so if you're concerned about the health of your tree, we would encourage you to contact a certified arborist. And so arborists are people that specialize in the care of trees and certified arborists are trained and knowledgeable in all aspects of the care of trees. Um, we have the arborist certification for the ISA. It's a non-governmental voluntary process. And so we would encourage you to hire a certified arborist. Certainly if you need pruning for trees that are fairly large, maybe over 15 feet, um, if you, you know, for the safety of the um, tree and yourself, and then also, if you're concerned about, you know, the health of your tree or safety, um, you know, if you've seen some signs of decline, maybe, or if you're worried about something in your tree, 
um, we would really encourage you to contact a certified arborist who specializes in the health of trees and can um, help you determine you know, whether that tree is safe and how to properly prune um, that tree as well. And so you can go to treesaregood.org and then select find an arborist to find a local um, arborist in your community. Here are just a few references and resources. And so just a review, um, we looked at trees with kind of interesting or unusual bark that's completely natural um, and nothing is wrong with those trees with those characteristics. We looked at harmless things that grow in trees, um, epiphytes, including Spanish moss, fall moss, which are technically Tillandsia species related to bromeliads, um, lichens, and even resurrection fern. We looked at some parasites and other harmful things that might grow in trees like mistletoe, uh, strangler fig, and certainly out of control house plants or invasive plants. Um, we just talked about a few signs of trouble. So uh, within your tree, um, thinking about dead, broken, or even hanging branches, uh, signs of decay uh, or decay in tree, even if you don't have um, visual signs of that. And then um, additionally cavities. And again, it just depends um, with the cavity. We talked about, you know, thinking about the age of the tree, the location, what caused that cavity um, are all, you know, things to consider as, as to whether, um, you know, that's um, a bad sign in the tree. And so certainly, um, finally, you know, if you're worried about the health um, of a tree, we would encourage you to contact a certified arborist. And so again, you can find um, them located at treesaregood.org and select find an arborist. I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us, um, myself, um, or uh, contact our Master Gardener uh, Volunteer Plant Clinic. Um, you can reach us by phone or email. Um, please visit our website. And you can also follow us on social media at Polk Gardening.